Ladies and gentlemen, um, it's so lovely to see you on this beautiful morning. I'm going to just take a moment of stillness. Just, just, it's great to see one another to catch up. We'll just take a moment of quiet now, and we'll just listen a little bit more of um, Rebecca's violin before we begin the formal part of our service. Throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus was, was the guest at many homes and many meals and many occasions. But at the end of his life, on that last supper, he was the host. And he gave bread and wine to all who were present. Later on in our service, we're going to be sharing communion. And you're all welcome to Jesus' table because he welcomes you here. As we welcome one another, we welcome him. He's the object of our worship, but he's also the host. We're here by his invitation. We are his people. He's our Lord. So I'm going to say a prayer, and then the service will follow without any introductions seamlessly until the time when we share communion, and I'll explain a little bit more about how we're going to do that. But just please join me in prayer. Father, on this holy day when we remember your son giving himself as a ransom for many acknowledging that we are included in that many we want to welcome you here into our hearts and into our service as Lord and we want to give ourselves back to you today come Lord Jesus Amen
has come. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. You're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds.
This is a responsive reading from Philippians 2, so please join in with me for the words in italics on screen. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Although he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. i 
Hi, a little technical hitch. <laughs> um, but we're going to do a meditation now. So it's a, a long tradition of the um, church to, to follow the story of Jesus, um, sometimes with our imaginations. And it's not something that we often do in church, but... Oh, I'm being told to move. Here we go. How's that? Oh, it's very dark, isn't it? There. Can I be seen? Oh, still quite forward. <laughs> Woo, there we go. <laughs> it's a little bit eerie, isn't it? Sorry about that. Anyway, well, there we go. What we're going to do is do this meditation. And I, I just want to encourage you not to really look at me or pay much attention to me. Um, and maybe close your eyes, which is something that Christians have done every now and again to just sort of enter imaginatively into the story of Jesus' walk to the cross and, and on beyond. And so um, that's what we're going to do. So right, let's just take a moment of quiet and um, maybe close your eyes and just for you personally, tune into God and say your own personal prayer for a moment or two, asking God to reveal Jesus to you in a fresh way today, with new eyes. Maybe you'll see something today that you haven't seen before. And I'm just going to read this, so you can keep your eyes closed and just follow through in your imagination. Jesus, Rabbi, there's a murmured greeting as two avoiding eyes slide down involuntarily. Two faces, momentary fuse and then part. Two lips brush Jesus' cheek with the slightest of touches and it's done. A Judas kiss. It's a pinpoint of focus in a long, dark night. So fleeting, it could have gone unnoticed, this peculiar betrayal. Suddenly the pinpoint of focus bursts into a confused clamour as voices and bodies press forward and surround Jesus. Torches flicker, there is a sharp metallic sound of a sword being drawn and out of the clamour the clear words of Jesus cut even sharper across the air. Who are you looking for? Good question. The enigma of Judas has occupied the minds of many who have followed in Jesus' footsteps. He is a puzzle. How is it that someone could have spent all that time with Jesus and end up so deep in the valley of betrayal? How could you walk with him, talk to him, watch him heal, see demons flee, watch how the ruling elite is flawed and lost for words that is other worldly wisdom and still choose betrayal? Scripture tells us that his loyalty was compromised when he dipped his hands in the common purse. Somehow, he lost sight of the goodness of Jesus and chose to partner with evil in a shady deal involving 30 pieces of silver. We wonder, who was Jesus, Judas, really looking for? Like first century Palestine, our world is in turmoil. The news has fed us a diet of war for these last few weeks and it has been painful to behold. Scenes of unrelenting violence, power struggles and leaders without wisdom cross the screens. Justice is miscarried over and over again and confusion reigns as lies are paraded without shame and world leaders partner with evil. No one knows what to do. What will stem this vast tide of evil? How can we keep sight of the goodness of God? Where is the wisdom for our time? Jesus' brother James wrote about wisdom in AD 65 when he faced down persecution that would eventually lead to his death at the hands of King Herod. He said this, Bitter envy and selfish ambition does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, 
Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Theologian N.T. Wright says this, If you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what it means to be human, look at Jesus. If you want to know what love is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what grief is, look at Jesus. And go on looking until you're not just a spectator, but you are actually part of the drama which has him as the central character. Jesus is heaven's wisdom. And today we pray, dear God, show us Jesus in a clearer light. Show us your ways as we look at the cross. And give us a fresh revelation of your divine love today, we pray. Jesus enters Jerusalem to a hero's welcome. Word spreads and the crowds gather, laying their coats on the road in welcome. He rides on a donkey through the golden gate to the accompanying praise of the people. The golden gate entrance signals loud and clear to a people steeped in prophecy that an ancient prediction is being fulfilled before their very eyes. Their prophet Zechariah had told them, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. And so the heady scent of victory is in the air. The one who had promised them peace not so long ago is about to to procure it in the most satisfying of ways by overthrowing the Roman oppressors and really vindicating their cause. But as the people praise God for all they have seen, something seems disjointed. Jesus is looking at Jerusalem and weeping, saying, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, But now it is hidden from your eyes, for you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. His words strike a jarring note amongst the jubilation. He seems he sees beyond the temporary affection and his diagnosis of their blindness is as sure as a surgeon's knife. How do you recognize a visitation by God? By what sign do you know him? What does his voice sound like to you? Who are you looking for? Jesus said that peace would be a sign of his presence as God makes his home in our hearts through faith. But the real challenge is to give God room in that fickle place of reactive ways and divided loyalties as the crowd was soon to demonstrate In a simple room, laid out for a meal, Jesus is washing Judah's feet. No one knows who was first in line, but we know that when it came to Peter's turn, there was much protesting. Wash all of me then, if you're really going to wash my feet, he says provocatively. But Jesus replies, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean though not every one of you. He alone knows what is fermenting in Judah's heart. And with a towel around his waist, Jesus moves on and kneels to wash his betrayer's feet and then carefully dry them. You can feel the tension rising as Jesus leads the confused disciples through the Passover meal, hinting twice at a betrayer in their midst. They are full of questions Unknown to them, behind the scenes, a greater tension is building. As in the unseen realm, the plans of God to bring his people home are set in place. And on planet Earth, evil is uncoiling and preparing to strike. And Jesus calmly dries Judah's feet. At about midnight, Jesus and the disciples leave and make their way out of the city, crossing the Kidron Valley and entering the Garden of Gethsemane on the slopes of Mount Olive. Mount of Olives. Jesus, deeply troubled, kneels in prayer as the reality of what he was about to do bears down upon him. 
Luke's Gospel says these words. He asks his friends to watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw away and knelt down to pray. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done, he prays. And in anguish he prays more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood dropping to the ground. Paul the Apostle would one day write, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Nothing shall separate us. The truth is, none of these things have the power to separate us from Christ's love because he has experienced them too. On Gethsemane's slopes, the Son of God felt agonizing, lonely, sorrow and pain that threatened to overwhelm him as love held him there in the darkness. And later, the Apostle Paul would again write, drawn to this suffering Jesus, I want to know this Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering becoming like him in his death. But in these moments, the only person claiming to know him was the man who kissed his cheek in the dark and unleashed the combined forces of religion and the Roman Empire on Jesus. Who are you looking for? Jesus is the God who meets you in the garden, in the fellowship of suffering. He is full of mercy and full of grace. Let's give him thanks. Now comes the Judas kiss. And Jesus is led out of the garden under armed guard. He is taken to the house of the high priest and standing within earshot of Peter's whining betrayal, the last connection to his friends is severed leaving him alone to face the wrath of the priests and the teachers of the law. The guards begin mocking and beating him, demanding, prophesy, who hit you? An onslaught of humiliation and false accusation ends with Jesus being dragged into an audience with the insecure ruler, King Herod. Herod was known as the Tetrarch, meaning the quarter king. He had something to prove and amused himself with ridiculing the silent Jesus before sending him back to the Roman ruler Pilate in disgust. And there, in his opulent court, Pilate probes Jesus. Ill at ease, he is trying to work out the dynamics of power. Are you a king, he asks. Your own people have handed you over. What is it that you have done? John's Gospel records Jesus' reply. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. My kingdom is from another place. Pilate can't see the place. He reluctantly takes Jesus out and has him whipped. The ends of the leather straps have bone and metal embedded into them, leaving Jesus back raw and bleeding. By the time they had finished with him, he was stripped of his clothing. A thorny crown pressed into his scalp, and he had dragged a heavy wooden crossbeam through the streets of Jerusalem to a hill outside the city limits. On a patch of ground outside the city walls, nicknamed the Skull, Jesus was executed. At Pilate's instruction, they put up a makeshift sign, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, the Jewish leaders protest, but Pilate's insistence leaves you wondering. I think he is unnerved by the quiet power of Jesus and is hedging his bets. Scripture tells us that one day, every knee will bow to this king. Every earthly ruler will meet him and give an account of their rule and reign. On that day, the proudest knee will bow. And the most arrogant mouth will say his name. One day, every eye will see him. 
But today the king is unrecognisable with his bruised cheeks and split lips. Luke's gospel records two other men, both criminals, were also led out to be executed. And when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right and one on the left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching and sneered at him. They said he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God. One writer says this about this scene. Jesus doesn't give an explanation for the pain and sorrow for the world of the world. He comes where pain is most acute and takes it upon himself. Jesus doesn't explain why there is suffering, illness and death in the world. He brings healing and hope. He doesn't allow the problem of evil to be the subject of a seminar. He allows evil to do its worst to him. He exhausts it, drains its power, and emerges with new life. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God! My God, why have you forsaken me? Then Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. And the centurion standing in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died and said, Surely this man was the son of God. He saw in that moment. Bitter envy and selfish ambition does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual and demonic, said James, perhaps remembering the pale body of his brother stretched out on the cross by threatened men. But wisdom that comes down from heaven is pure and peace-loving. Jesus is heaven's wisdom He is pure and peace-loving. Do you know him? Do you recognise him? Are you looking for him? Do you long to be like him? Even now, in our tormented world, he is at work sowing peace and righteousness, his followers still pursuing his goodness in the darkness. A Ukrainian pastor asked this week, what does it take to win a war? What does it take to destroy an enemy, to defeat evil? (coughs) He answered his own question. The Lord gives us weapons that can surprise us. God says that the secret of victory is forgiveness. Forgiveness is a battlefield in the human heart, But it can be the light within you that will never be consumed by darkness. Because those that sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Jesus is heaven's wisdom. And there is a harvest coming. So far in the service, we've been mainly watching and listening. But we're also called to be participants, to join in the mission of Jesus. And in taking communion today, what we are doing is saying we are following that man. And we're following his ways. We're choosing to follow the way of love and to embrace the call to be people who in his strength embrace the world. So you're invited to come to the tables. There's one on my left, one on my right, one here and one there. And we've got prepared um, grape juice and bread, so no, no contact from human hands in this state anyway. 
Um, you could just come to one of the tables and there'll be people there who, who may just want to navigate, help you navigate if you're stuck and, and pray with you as well. And while we're taking communion, worship will be flowing because worship is all about sacrifice at the end of the day. It's about God's sacrifice for us and us offering ourselves back to him as living sacrifices. So I'm going to take a moment to pray over the bread and the cup here. But let's just, in the quietness of our own hearts, make our commitment again to God, confessing our sins and receiving again amazing grace. Father, like your first disciples, the first disciples of Jesus, we have been people who have denied and betrayed in small or large actions or inactions. And as Jesus said to you, Father, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Father, today, we pray that you'd forgive us for our sins in the name of Jesus. We turn from them. We give ourselves to you. We choose life. Fill us again with your Holy Spirit. Amen. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body given for you. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who was whole, was broken so that broken people like us could be made whole. And after supper, Jesus took a cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And this Good Friday, we remember that Jesus died. But we celebrate that he is risen. And we look forward to his coming again and proclaim his death until he comes. I'm going to invite you to say the words of the acclamation, familiar to many. Let's say it together. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And will you come in your own time to one of the tables and share in this sacrament with us? Thank you. 
Why don't we stand together? We're going to end our service with 
worshipping together.
prayer. God of mystery and wonder, because we know the ending of the story, it's tempting for us to ignore the darkness of this day. It's tempting for us to go about our business as usual. It's tempting for us to move too quickly to the dawn of light on Easter morning. But give us courage and strength on this day to live for a while in the darkness to set aside comfort and pleasure, to feel the darkness in which so many of your children dwell around the world. The darkness into which your son Jesus entered. Gracious God, deep in the human heart is an unquenchable trust that life does not end with death. Like a seed which is buried in order to bring forth life, Christ goes to the tomb to usher in new life. And we trust that we too will be raised to life in this world, here and now, and in the mystery of what lies beyond. We trust that the whole world will be born anew, and that your kingdom is coming as a new heaven and a new earth. And on this day of darkness, it is for this kingdom that we boldly pray, our Father. And now may you know the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit upon you. May he make his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May he be lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace today. Amen. <laughs>